Uh, so you are in the workshop of uh, endometrial receptivity analysis and um, during the next, I think, three or f four hours, we are going to walk you through uh, what endometrial receptivity means for us and what are the diagnostic tests that we have created, how they work, and also what is the future, the next one, which is the non-invasive that we are just developing. So. Uh, we, you are going to have uh, four speakers, and the learning objectives of this workshop is going to be, as you have here, first, I will try to, to walk with you through the understanding of human endometrial receptivity. Then I will just show the data about the endometrial receptivity array that, as you know, we are changing the name to endometrial receptivity analysis because it's not done anymore by array CGH, but rather to NGS. So we are just moving uh, by technology changing at that moment. And what is the consequence of this test uh, in, in terms of the therapeutic option that it's opening for us, which is the personalized embryo transfer. Then uh, uh, Maria Ruiz, who is the, the lab manager, the ERA manager that they are working on that, uh, she will try to, to to explain you what is the logistics, what are the minor things that they are causing a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainties, uh, so we can revise this with her. Then uh, Dr. Balbuena, the um, genomics uh, medical manager, will update you about the clinical impact of the ERA test, not only in implantation failure, as you will hear from me, but also in some specific, in some specific indications such as endometriosis, obesity, they went to analyze, the, they went through analyze what is the real uh, receptivity in molecular terms comparing the thickness of the endometrium. So all of these things will be, will be presented. And finally, uh, Dr. Felipe Vilella will discuss with you what are the non-invasive, the new non-invasive diagnostic methods in progress that we are developing working on the endometrial fluid and then trying to really apply in the same cycle that we can actually transfer the embryos. So these are uh, the learning objectives that we will try to accomplish during the, the next uh, hours, and um, those are the speakers involved. I will be delighted if you can uh, interrupt us. If you have any questions, please ask. Uh, it's not a problem. Interaction is very welcome and also is needed. I know that this, there is always some questions and uncertainties when we present this, so be, feel free to, to ask because we really want that you understand uh, what we are doing and what we are providing for you because this is, at the end, this is basic research that has produced a molecular tool that is being applied now in clinics worldwide. Uh, this this era test is being, uh, we, we are uh, doing more or less 800 cycles, 800 biopsies per month. So more than 8,000 patients has been already analyzed. We have huge data, and this is what we want to share with you this afternoon, okay? So first, what I would like to do, to do is just to, uh, uh, to set up the, 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 the scene, which is try to understand what is human endometrial receptivity and uh, um, where do we come from? The understanding of the human endometrium come from more than 50 years ago. This type of lecture is unusual because you hear a lot about the embryo, you hear about the oocyte, you hear about the ovary, but the human endometrium, I can tell you, I have witnessed that, has been neglected for a long time. In fact, I have been only, I have been the, 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 the few of, of researchers that they have been always trying to understand what happens in the mother, because whatever we do, if uh, the endometrium doesn't work, then you will end up in unsuccessful cycle. So that's why it's so important to understand this. Uh, the first piece of information that we can find was the classical criteria from Noyes. Uh, you know that they have more than 50 years now, and what they did is what they use histology, try to define what could be a, a luteal phase day to day. They were great at that moment. In fact, this is the most quoted paper in OBGYN until now. But again, this is histology, is anatomical medicine, but this was the beginning, trying to see 
by histology what the characteristics are, the features of a luteal phase endometrium, which is different than a receptive endometrium. Okay, so this is the main thing. One thing is to define what is going on in the luteal phase, and the other thing is to know when an endometrium is receptive, and this is something that we will discuss later. The second is um, there is some news about embryo attachment and invasion, and this occurred in the late 50s. Uh, we have those first uh, uh, morphology, those pictures. You have the Carnegie collection. You have things that indicate how the endometrium, the, the embryo implants in the endometrium, how they invade. Uh, so we were learning a lot from that. And uh, um, we have a lot of work in the 80s and the 90s trying, to go, going for the single molecule approach, trying to see what is the magic bullet that can let us know this endometrium is receptive uh, what, uh, or this is not receptive. All of this fails. And uh, I, was, I witnessed that. I was working on this time. Everybody has their own favorite molecule uh, with, a, with a profile that can just fit on that. But at the, end, at the end, nothing predictive come at the clinical level to really say, yes, this is receptive, or no, this is non-receptive. The only thing that remains from this single molecule approach was clear, which is the progesterone receptor and the estradiol receptor. This is clear. If we just block progesterone receptor, we have no implantation. But the opposite doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, if we activate progesterone receptor, doesn't mean that we have a receptive endometrium. Okay, so yes, if we block the uh, progesterone receptor, then the whole, uh, the whole pathway is finished. Uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, we can just improve endometrial receptivity by adding more progesterone. Then uh, we have at the clinical level, uh, the ultrasound is nice. We, the gynecologists, we have learned a lot from that. And we are, I mean, it has helped us a lot to, to do this. And then it came what is the morphology, the thickness and the pattern of the endometrium. And with that, we say, okay, that's it. We have a seven millimeter endometrium, this is receptive. Okay, it's not such, it's not as simple as that. Of course, if we have a normal thickness, which is between seven, 6.5 to 12, it's okay, but it doesn't mean that it's receptive. In fact, as you will see, uh, this is not the case. Only 70% of cases will be receptive. 30% will not be receptive. Uh, because, again, this is anatomical medicine and not molecular medicine. But again, this thickness was important because when we have an atrophic endometrium, these are bad news. And in fact, you will see from our molecular tools that when you have an atrophic endometrium, things are not working properly and you have higher a percentage of non-receptive endometrium, which is true. But, uh, but again, it's not like a one-to-one. -one. Um, then um, we work also in many, many other groups. What happens in IVF? Are we just affecting implantation because we are going to pharmacological levels of estradiol and progesterone? And yeah, we, we have this theory, we work on that. And indeed, nowadays, because of the vitrification uh, potential, we now are working on whether the old transfer approach could be better than the fresh transfer approach, and we will talk about that also. So this is something that came from far away. Uh, in the 90s, we have finally, I think that uh, we come together with a very simple concept. You have to have both to have a dance. So you have to have a synchrony between a receptive endometrium and a chromosomally normal viable embryo and they must coincide in the time. Otherwise, doesn't matter whether you have the best blastocyst or I have the best receptive endometrium. The synchrony is important, and this is what the test is about. And you will see that it's so necessary that both things are at the same time. In the 90s, we have also uh, the starting of uh, DNA technology using microarray. So this was the moment that instead of going for single molecule approach, we try many of them. And this is just the, the general approach in oncology to look for gene signatures. And this is what we have done. Look for gene signatures that can inform us about a function, which is in this case, is endometrial receptivity, which means that this is the moment that the endometrial epithelium acquires a phenotype that allow himself to be adhered by, by the embryo. Otherwise, 
there is no way that there will be implantation or pregnancy because of the window of implantation only occurs in a certain moment. So because of that, we have been looking for this gene signature and uh, as, as well as the others has looked for different functions. And this is why we have developed after 10 years of work, this endometrial receptivity array using this approach of gene signature challenging. Then in, the, in, the, in just very more recently, non-invasive methods came and uh, in fact, now we, have, we are working on single, if you came this morning, uh, we are working already on single cell uh, analysis, <clears throat> which is the next step to, to have this done. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the era was developed here, and, uh, and uh, th this is basically the, the, the path of this. Now, let's go for, for single concept, which is an embryo is by definition sticky. An embryo is by definition able to adhere any place. And uh, you, the clinicians that are in this, in this room, you know that uh, we have to check the catheter, the, the transfer catheter always, and sometimes we have to repeat because it gets attached to the plastic. So it's quite of nonsense that why this guy is able to adhere to any place due to this conformation, and when the trophoectoderm is produced, then the adhesiveness start, and why it does not implant the place that it should be, which is the maternal endometrium. And uh, you know the answer is quite simple, and the answer is because this window of implantation. So there is a specific moment during the menstrual cycle, only a moment that the endometrium develop this capacity to be adhered by the blastocyst, doesn't matter if it's day five or day six, it adheres and uh, invades. And this is about the endometrial epithelium. As mentioned, changing the phenotype of the endometrial epithelium, transforming the microvilli in <coughs> flattened surface. It's what is called plasma membrane transformation. So addition will occur the those cells became apoptotic and will allow that the embryo will just cross the epithelial barrier and enter in the stroma and invasion starts. And this, this, this type of, of uh, experiment has been done in animals. If you just scrape, but you have to do it very gently, the epithelium and you put the embryo, the embryo will implant. If uh, uh, when we are producing uh, human embryonic stem cells, we just place embryos in a monolayer of stromal cells. All of them attach. But if you place them in an epithelial monolayer, they will not attach. So we know that is the epithelial barrier that is the important thing in the developing this window of implantation. Now, the issue here is we all believe from the work of Hertig and colleagues that they were uh, very important works, but uh, I can, I mean, they just calculate the moment of ovulation using a urine analysis. It's not even the LH, so things may change. They just calculate that this is the right day for uh, implantation, for addition. So we always consider that uh, five days of progesterone in a natural, in a, in a cycle, in an HRT cycle, or LH plus seven is the moment where always the window of implantation will be ready. This is what we have uh, going through. And uh, it's quite uh, strange because we all believe, I think, if not, please let me know, in personalized medicine. And we, not, we do not give the same amount of gonadotrophins to our patients. We do not treat the embryos of our patients all the same. We do not treat the semen all the same. But when it comes to the endometrium, that's it. We transfer our embryos wherever the embryos are ready. And if she has a, a seven millimeters, it's fine. If has a 12, it's also fine. If, because we cannot intervene. We cannot diagnose. We cannot intervene except give progesterone to the patient. Uh, so this is what, what has been going on until now. And keep in mind this slide, because at the end of my presentation, you will see what we think about this. And, uh, and so this is the, the, the passive view, the static view of where endometrial receptivity can be found, where the window will be, okay? So again, going backwards, as mentioned to you, dating of endometrial biopsy was going on since the 50, but now at this time, uh, there, is, there are randomized studies trying to 
really check whether a normal morphology in the luteal phase means receptivity. And certainly, those studies, they were conclusive because interobservable and cycle-to-cycle -cycle variation, they were huge. And also, <clears throat> also, endometrial dating was not related to the fertility status whatsoever. You have those uh, randomized clinical studies done. And I think that nowadays, nobody can just, uh, nobody's using endometrial histology uh, to, pr to predict endometrial receptivity, I hope. Huh? And uh, the other uh, issue that we have in clinic, the only one, is just the ultrasound. Again, as mentioned, we know, you know perfectly that this is not predictive. It has been going on for a long time about the pattern, about the endometrial thickness. Uh, so we cannot say that because this uh, thickness, you have this possibility. No, more or less, they are all, all of them the same. Uh, so this is the other thing that we have. Now, uh, the issue is we really uh, have to take advantage of what happens around our specialty. And new technologies are exploding. And this is nothing new that uh, in order to know more, we have to be able to understand new technologies. You can work on the DNA. This is the, 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 the genomics. You can work on the transcriptomics, which is the expression of the genes that you are interested. And this is the, what we talk about gene signature in here. Or you can just study the proteins produced from the function that you are, you are looking for. This is the, the proteome. Or go to the metabolome. We just went through, basically, the transcriptomics because the transcriptomics has been shown in other specialties, mainly oncology, that they have a real impact, uh, looking for gene signatures of many functions. And also, you saw that some tumors, in addition to the histological appearance, they have to have the transcriptomic signature to know whether they have any mutations or any type of deletions. And this will mark somehow the treatment. And you will be more effective if you really look for the specific transcriptomic markers. So learning from that, what we did, we published in 2011. After 10 years of research, we published the endometrial receptivity array. In this array, this was done after we did all of this work. This is just an example. And the color papers, they just come from my group. And you can have all of the information in this uh, database, which is free online. And what I mean is that a lot of research has been done in the endometrium, in the natural cycle, in stimulated cycles, in uh, even with patients that we introduce an IUD in order to know what a refractory endometrium looks like, what is the expression genes when we create a refractory endometrium, or when we have an optimal or suboptimal endometrium. Learning from all of this, we just create, we just uh, find out this signature. This signature, which is published, and uh, I just show you this. You are not going to, well, if you are very fast, you can read it, but uh, it's published. So it's in the paper that I mentioned to you in the 2011. And we just went one to one, not only for four changes. This is the number of probes that we have in our customized, uh, customized array, the repetitions of that. And uh, we ended up having initially uh, this customized array with those. 238 genes. Nowadays, we are just moving to NGS. So that's why we are calling now endometrial receptive analysis, because it's not an array anymore. But at the end, we are using the same, the same signature, only that we are using now a new technology that will be able to, to, have, uh, to have better improvement in terms of, of uh, logistics and, and back and forth. Now, this result, the expression of these genes, is coupled to a bioinformatic predictor and a classificator. And then this classificator gives us a very simple, straightforward message, which is, yes, the endometrium that you send it to me is not receptive yet. It's pre-receptive. It needs more days of progesterone, maybe one, maybe two. We will let you know, according to our system, how many days or how many hours do you need more to have a receptive endometrium. The message could be, yeah, <coughs> the endometrium that you send to us is receptive. Whatever you do in your natural cycle or in HRT, you have to repeat that the same to transfer your embryos. And with that, this is fine. Or the window already passed. You need less days of progesterone. 
instead of five days, if this is a, a HRT, you just need only three or only four or four and a half. Maria is the one that will let you know, will let you know exactly what is it, and we can find this as a predictor. And with this analysis, you have two options. You can repeat that in case that is non-receptive and we'll let you know this. You have to give seven days of progesterone. You can repeat to be sure, or you can go ahead with that. Our, the chances that we have certainty is 90%. I will show you the data. The only thing that we fail is when the patient has a narrow window and then we catch the window between two biopsies. I will show you the data later on. So this is what we do. Now, what is the time of cycles that uh, we have to look for. You have to, we do the analysis in those cycles that uh, you are going to transfer the same that you are going to transfer the embryo. So typically, we suggest to do it either in a natural cycle or in a hormonal replacement therapy cycle. And this is because all the studies that we did, this gene signature was worked out to know what happens in a natural endometrium in a physiologically prime endometrium. The problem here is, and is something that uh, we can discuss, is that uh, the endometrium is the same for your patients throughout their lifetime of the patient. What is different is the hormonal treatment that we give to our patient. So the genomic signature is the same if the, uh, the, the situation, the hormonal situation is the same. That's why we cannot use this for stimulated cycles, because if we take the ERA test in one patient uh, that we are having 2,000, and then next cycle she has 3,000 picograms of estradiol, then the effect on the regulation of the endometrium, we, we, don't know, we don't know about that. We are sure about this, that if you repeat that in a LH plus seven, or in an H HCG, uh, sorry, in a, a progesterone plus five, this is exactly, this is something that you can control, okay? And we rather prefer the last one than the previous one. The last one is so easy to do it, and I suggest we are doing this for a long time. In order to prime this, we just have, when the patient comes with a menstruation, we give her six milligrams of progesterone, uh, sorry, of estradiol valerate, six milligram per day, starting the first day for one week. In one week time, I ask the patient to come. I do the ultrasound. If she has 6.57 millimeters, then I add the progesterone. And then you can take the biopsy after five days, five full days of progesterone, which means only 12 days. You don't need antagonists. You don't need agonists. And you just need one ultrasound. And with that, you, you take the biopsy, send it to us, and we can do the analysis. This is the most simple way that we have to assess endometrial receptivity. But then you have to transfer the embryo in the same way. The embryo will be frozen, and you have to, to do it in the same way, okay? For progesterone, the timing of exposure is similar to LH, which is LH plus seven means that you have the LH peak, and you count one, two, three, and seven days, okay? Progesterone is the same. If you give progesterone now, day one of progesterone will be tomorrow at this time. It's not like for FSH that we say, okay, and this is now FSH, first day, FSH today, no. So this is the way that, that we count it, okay? <clears throat> now, the first question that we asked to ourselves was, how accurate is this test? Because now we are talking about a molecular signature. This is the transition between anatomical and molecular medicine, so we have to be sure comparing to the previous one. How accurate and how consistent is this? We published this in 2013, and uh, what we did is to compare the accuracy in terms of kappa value uh, of the ERA test versus two pathologists using the Noyes criteria, and one pathology versus the other. As you see, kappa value numbers are clear here, and uh, the most effective was, of course, in the pre-receptive, receptive, and post-receptive endometrium compared to the pathologies. Anatomy, histology was only superior in the proliferative phase, which, of course, we don't need it at this moment. Then we went through the consistent. This is just the first series, but we have another series that has been already checked. And these are donors, that uh, those are patients that uh, we analyze the error test in the same patient using the, the, the same type of hormonal treatment 
at the same day of this treatment. And by doing this, the results between the first and the second biopsy, considering even up to 40 months apart, the results were just the same. Uh, therefore, this was important for us to know about consistency. And we have repeated that in another series of, of, uh, of donors. And also, we have, this, this is our day today, that uh, we, when we do that, we have patients now that they became, that they try to become pregnant again after they got the first baby after the era prediction, and they stick on the same type of prediction, and it works. So we have now accumulated data that we know that, uh, that when we say is receptive, if uh, you are using this type of approach, this type of hormonal treatment, it will be consistent <coughs> in the future, at least 40 months here, and nowadays we have up to three years after from we start to do this, this test. And the first thing that we did uh, at this time was to try our test in the most difficult situation. This is like a compassive treatment, let's say, like, like that. So, and the most difficult uh, type of patients that we have is, are basically patients with recurrent implantation failure. You have a seat here. <clears throat> patients with recurrent implantation failure. So, in these patients, what we did, this is a prospective, non-randomized uh, study in which we have 80 patients with recurrent implantation failure versus 25 patients as a control. Recurrent implantation failure means basically five previous failure in those patients because we select the most difficult uh, population that we can have. And this was the control was patients undergoing for the first time uh, um, IVF. And what we just saw from the very beginning was something surprising, which is that uh, in those patients with implantation failure, uh, we have 70, when we did the, the ERA test, 74% came as receptive. In other words, 25% they were non-receptive. One in four patients, they were non-receptive at the time that we transferred the embryos. So uh, what we did is, okay, let's go ahead and transfer the embryos now at this moment in those patients that they have previous failure with different type of approaches, fresh, uh, frozen, and so by doing this, in those same patients with receptive endometrium, now implantation rate in those patients, they went through, it was 33%, pregnancy rate 51%. Those with five previous, five previous IVF failure. Somehow, this was normalizing. This is not the panacea, of course. This is not, uh, we are not inventing here something, but at least those patients that never became pregnant because an endometrial factor, now we achieve similar levels as the normal population. Of course, the embryonic factor is there. In fact, you see the controls, they have now 55% implantation rate and 81% a pregnancy rate, probably because the embryonic factor was less important in this population going for the first time uh, IVF, okay? And now you can tell me, yeah, but the, you did a, to do an ERA test, you get a small endometrial biopsy, so you are doing a scratching, and I'm telling you no. We are not, uh, the, the scratching thing is completely useless, but in addition to that, look at this graph, okay? So we went to our patients, and we talk about now uh, this amount of patients, and once we do the error test, the patient can come back to get the transfer done wherever they want. So they can come back the first month after the error test, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, or half a year after that. When they come back and we transfer the embryo as predicted, this is the implantation uh, and pregnancy rate. As you see, they are more or less flattened and even the contrary. I mean, if there is some uh, effect of an endometrial injury here, uh, of course, uh, results are the same, but the, the, these even are increasing. Also, the number here is lower. This is maybe the reason. The point here is you don't see a peak because <clears throat> a direct effect. You just see a flat line, more or less, because this is just a prediction. This is a diagnostic test that lets you know when to transfer the embryo, regardless of the timing from the biopsy to the analysis. And what happens with the patients that they were non-receptive? The patients that they were non-receptive 
uh, the majority of them, they were pre-receptive. Again, this was the, our fir very first study. I will show you more data. So the majority of them, they were pre-receptive, 84%. We have some post-receptive. And what we did is for the first time, we <coughs> transferred the embryo according to the endometrium. We have, uh, we have done embryo transfer of a blastocyst in a day, a progesterone day seven endometrium, or a blastocyst in a day three, progesterone day three endometrium. Everything was against the, how was the transcriptomic status of the endometrium. And by doing this on purpose, we got from this pilot study, again, 35, 38% implantation rate, 50% pregnancy rate in the patient with implantation failure that we have changed, we have just modified this um, displacement of the window of implantation. So remember this slide, the point here is this is not like that anymore. In some patients, and we talk about at least 30% of patients, the window of implantation is delayed and also could be advanced. And some patients, they have a narrow window of implantation. Most of them with uterine, with congenital uterine abnormalities, T uterus, uh, unicornuate uterus, either bicornuate uterus, every horn could be in a different receptive status, and we have experienced that, because sometimes you cannot transfer the embryo in the horn that you want, and then you have the results. So we have the prediction that you have to transfer in this because this is receptive and this is non-receptive, and the doctor tell me, okay, I, I couldn't, I just transfer on this, no pregnancy. Or the other way around, I transfer on the right one, and it became pregnant. So we have, we have seen this already. And uh, let me show you, this is a, um, a <clears throat> uh, this is a case report and a pilot study that we published, and uh, Maria was the, the first author on that. And the, the title is, What a Difference Today Make? Personalized Embryo Transfer, which is how we call this type of approach. And uh, this is a patient that came to our clinic. It was treated by, by a colleague of mine. And uh, she has already two failed cycles. She was 39, and we just uh, suggested uh, to go for uh, PGS. She, that, she didn't want to go for chromosome analysis of the embryo, we say, okay, let's, whatever you want, let's go ahead. So my colleague started to do the dance of, uh, of IVF, transferring blastocysts, transferring uh, fresh, all frozen in natural cycle, uh, and then the patient just was 41, something like that. So we suggest to go for the ovum donation, that we have a huge ovum donation here in Valencia, and uh, again, uh, she has transfer with a day three embryo in an HRT cycle. Uh, we have a day three embryo in a natural cycle or blastocyst in an HRT cycle as we used to transfer in the past, always at, pre, at, at progesterone plus five. So at that moment, the, the error test became available, so we did that, and this patient was just pre-receptive at progesterone plus five, and it was just receptive at progesterone plus seven. So next cycle, what we did is to transfer the embryo at <coughs> day seven of progesterone. Because the test was initiating, we could not uh, resist, the patient was to have two embryos transfer, so we did this personalized embryo transfer using two uh, day five blastocysts, and the patient have a successful twin pregnancy up to the end, fortunately. We don't like to transfer two embryos, and, um, and, but in this case, we have to do it. So, this is just an example that uh, straightforward at the first attempt, transferring the <coughs> embryos at the right moment, we have a pregnancy after seven previous failures, three with open donation. So what I used to say is just try with your most difficult patient. That's it. The patient that uh, you don't know what to do, just try and uh, you will experience uh, what we have seen already. <coughs> this is a pilot study in which we receive samples, as you know, from all over the world. So this was 17 patients undergoing ovum donation that uh, all of them, they have a lousy implantation and pregnancy rate in the first attempt and in the cumulative and zero ongoing pregnancy rate. So even if they became pregnant, they end up in clinical or biochemical abortions. So we <coughs> analyze those endometrium and it shows that uh, none of them, they were receptive. The majority were pre-receptive. We have some post-receptive and uh, we 
uh, just Maria call to our colleagues and tell them, look, this is the timing that you have to transfer to do a personalized embryo transfer. And now by transferring the embryo at the right time, uh, the same 17 patients that we are analyzing, they just got a 34% implantation rate, 52% pregnancy rate, 66 ongoing in the first attempt. That goes for 40%, 60%, and 75 as a cumulative pregnancy rate. And the only thing that we did was a personalized embryo transfer according to the diagnostic test and that uh, indicates where the window of implantation was. So the point here is this, personalized embryo transfer as a treatment because uh, every, every patient is different and we have to, to go for a personalized medicine approach. This is what we used to do, five days of progesterone or LH plus seven, but the point now is that the window we have seen that can go from three days of progesterone up to seven days of progesterone, or if you put in LH perspective, but uh, this is where the window is, and it's not about what is the best day, it's about what is the best day for your patient. It's, that, that it's completely useless to try all of them with six days. It's the same like if you go for an outside pickup in all your patients after six days of gonadotrophins. What is best, six days or seven days of gonadotrophins? You will let me know what are you talking about? I just treat to my patient, I do the ultrasound, and I do the oocyte pickup, the best day for my patient. This is what I'm telling you. Do the same for the endometrium, because the patient, in addition to the ovaries, has endometrium, okay? That's, uh, that's the point. So all what I mentioned to you already is published information, and you are going to hear more about my colleagues, but I just want to show you some, some, some data that you will see also in, from my colleagues. We have already analyzed more than 8,000 patients. This was taken two months ago. Uh, and uh, again, we have, we stick with this 30% non-receptive and, uh, and 70, uh, more or less 70 receptive. The majority of non-receptive, they are pre-receptive. They need more days of progesterone. Remember, the, the, the issue here is timing. Doesn't matter the route that you give the progesterone, really doesn't matter to give intramus intra intramuscular is really to punish your patient. Uh, instead, uh, except in very specific cases, the delivery of progesterone is absolutely the same if you give it vaginal, uh, if you give it intramuscular, if you give it subcutaneous. It's not about the delivery. It's not about the dosage of, of progesterone. You know that they are reported uh, ongoing pregnancies with four nanograms of progesterone. So it's not about the dosage of progesterone, whatever pills we give them, and you know that we overdose when we give progesterone, it will have enough uh, progesterone to, to really uh, make that it will be possible. It's not about the route, it's not about the dosage, it's about the timing. It's the timing what matters. In fact, in your fresh cycle, if you have a premature elevation of progesterone, if you see that the day of ACG you got uh, two nanograms of progesterone, you will stop and you will freeze your embryos. You will not transfer them. And you know why? Because implantation rate will go down because the window has been moved. You do not control. But if you freeze your embryos, next cycle, in a control cycle, you will transfer them and you will succeed. This is just an example of how timing is important. Okay. So what I was mentioning is that pre-receptive, receptive, some proliferative, and we just say to our patient, to our doctors, uh, if this is pre-receptive, please check it. It's, you have to do it a day plus seven. Um, if you want to be sure and it's a difficult patient, we suggest you to do it because in 91%, yes, we, we know that, that it is. But we have 5% uh, of cases that they have a narrow window. We have identified narrow windows of 12 hours that we have to put the transfer in this day. And uh, in this case, we will, so if the patient is very, very, very difficult, I suggest you at least to double check to avoid problems of repetition. This is something that we are preparing for publication and we presented in ISRM. And this is basically a 52 cases that for whatever reason, we just give the result of non-receptive and they were non-transfer uh, at the moment. I mean, they were transferred even if they were non-receptive. <clears throat> You have these 200 patients that they were receptive and they were transferred in the moment that we say to the doctors, yes, go ahead. 
In those non-receptive patients that they were transferred at this moment, which was the wrong moment, we have, again, a very bad implantation and pregnancy rate, zero ongoing. And uh, in those receptive patients, we have 45 implantation rate, 60% pregnancy rate, 74 ongoing. So, again, we have more and more and more data about that. And finally, what we are doing now, because we know that in difficult patients, this is the, the, what, what is going on, we want to explore whether these tests could be useful in terms of cost effectiveness just in the very first appointment. One, the patient enters through the door <coughs> to really do that, uh, the same like we do a seminogram or an AMH, just to do an error test. To be sure of that, we, have, we are doing this randomized study in which basically we are comparing in an IVF patient, first IVF patient, first cycle, uh, in, of course, the inclusion criteria, uh, they must be less than 38, they have to, the body max index, all of these things, whether they go through a fresh embryo transfer, which is a embryo transfer that we are doing routinely, or they are going through the arm of all frozen, so we will do a frozen embryo transfer, or they go through the C group, which is all frozen, we do the error test, and we transfer the embryos accordingly. So we do a personalized embryo transfer. This is the ongoing uh, RCT. Uh, and now, I mean, we have uh, many groups all over the world that they are collaborating with us on that. And uh, we hope to finish this at the end of the year. These are the, the last hospitals that they, they we, we hope to finish this in order to have a randomized study uh, somehow should indicating whether it will be cost effective or not to use as a first uh, treatment as a first diagnostic test in the in the first visit, uh, moving from implantation failure to the to the use. But we do not yet until the end. So, in conclusion, <coughs> what I want to to tell you about this is that basically, the best day for embryo transfer to your patients from the uterine perspective depends on your patient. The transcriptomic signature of endometrial receptivity using this test reveal that endometrial factor is responsible at least in one in four of your patients with implantation failure. Of course, the others will be the embryo. And personalized embryo transfer normalize clinical results, and this multicenter RCT is underway to answer the question whether ERA will be cost effective as the first diagnostic line for the endometrial factor. So this is basically the message and uh, also, I want to just show you this, that uh, we don't think that we are at the end. In fact, we are at the beginning. We are just right here in the first <laughs> mark. But I think that we can tune up the whole system, as you will see from my colleagues later on, uh, arising, uh, arriving where we, want, we really want to be. This test has some problems, and the problem is that this is invasive, and this must be done in the cycle prior to embryo transfer. We are just... Uh, working hard to avoid these two issues. First, to be non-invasive, and second, to be able to be done 24 hours be before embryo transfer, so you can just go ahead or not, uh, depending on the situation and not to wait. So again, we are just here, and I hope that uh, in two more years that we will have this meeting, I can tell you that we are somewhere right here or something like that, okay? And I just want to say that, of course, this is the work of uh, of a huge lab that I have at the basic level. And this has been uh, translated, and we have created this biotech company that uh, is based in all the continents now. And we have a huge team of people working on this and other products that we can translate and give to, to our colleagues and to our patients. And as you have seen this morning, has been founded in part by European Union grant, the, the SARM grant. And, um, and I'm here to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.